Well, good morning, everyone. I want you to understand that I'm half blind. I'm one arm wounded, but I'm here. And I'm glad that you're here this morning. It is such a joy uh, to be back with you this morning. Um, I want to pray for Josh this morning as he is beginning this, um, this revival uh, down in Chunky. And um, just look forward to hearing testimonies of what God is uh, going to be doing uh, with uh, that opportunity before him uh, this morning. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. And I do want to um, ask you to be patient uh, this morning. I had, not only have I had two carpal tunnel surgeries since the end of June, but I've also had two cataract surgeries in the last month and a half or so. And um, I can see, but I can't see clearly. It's kind of hard to read. And he's got to do an adjustment in my lenses here in a couple of weeks. And so bear with me as I read God's Word this morning. I hope I won't skip a word or read a word that's not there, so you just bear with me this morning as we look at this passage of Scripture. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. We are living in some very troubling times. I posted on Facebook, and I don't do this much, but I did share this, I think last week sometime or another, that most of us do not realize what we very well potentially could be facing as a nation in the next few months. And just on a personal level, sometimes life can be very difficult. Sometimes life can be a struggle. And there's no question in my mind, although we are not like it was in the days of the apostles and the prophets and, or, and whatnot, but it is becoming more and more and more difficult for people like you and I to be Christian, to live out our biblical beliefs in the public place, in the marketplace. It's becoming more and more difficult to do so at work and even in our communities today. Now, I, I'm going to sound very pessimistic, but, but I'm not pessimistic. I, I'm really an optimist at heart. And I hope that we will come across as one who is very positive and very encouraging and very challenging uh, to us this morning as the Holy Spirit of God fills my heart with this word from First Peter. Yes, things are going to be, are, are very uncertain right now. And things we just do not know. But this thing, one thing I do know, I do know that number one, Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for my sin. And I do know that three days later, he was risen from the dead. He defeated the, the, the two greatest enemies that we have here on this earth. One is our sin, the other is our death. And thank God Almighty that one day he is coming again. Now this morning, I want to give you four things from this passage of the scripture, that you and I are responsible for. Four things that you and I can do to the glory of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, to make a kingdom impact in this world today. Four things. The first one 
is pray, pray, pray. You may not be able to do anything else. You may not be able to do anything else that's listed in these verses that we're going to be examining this morning, but you can pray. Now notice verse 7. 1 Peter 4, verse 7. Peter writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious, that is, be sober-minded, and be watchful in your prayers. Now, the early church, the first century church, which Peter was addressing here, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, was facing a lot of uncertainty in life, much more than any uncertainty we're facing today today. Because for them, in that moment in time, it was either they denied Jesus or they died. Persecution. But Peter wrote this. He said, listen, guys, but the end of all things is near. Now, think about that statement for a moment. I believe with all of my heart, in fact, it is my firm conviction that Peter and James and John and Andrew and Simeon and other disciples that we don't even know about and the Apostle Paul, I believe that these men, the early first century church at least, they lived their life day in and day out as if they believed with all of their heart that Jesus was going to come back tomorrow. And beloved, I would say to you this morning, that is exactly how the Holy Spirit of God empowers us to live to the glory of God. He empowers us to live as if we honestly believe and that very well could happen tomorrow that Jesus could come again. Because the reality is, is that when he comes, the judgment seat of Christ is going to occur first. That, that means all of us who have believed upon the name of Jesus will have a day of accountability, a day of reward for the works that we have done here on this earth in the flesh, according to the Spirit. That day of accounting is coming. And I've often said this, that it should not be what has happened in the past of our life. It should not be what is going on in our life currently, but it is what is to come in our life. That is the judgment seat of Christ that should determine how we live our life day in and day out today. But the end of all things is near. And Peter said, church, be sober. Be of sound mind. Have a biblical worldview. And be watchful unto prayer. That is, be watchful for opportunities to pray. Be watchful, be attentive to ways that you can pray for others. One of the things, I may have shared this before, one of the things that we've started doing over the last year, year and a half, is that we have a food day at the associational office for uh, senior adults who are 65 and under, and who just are over, and just, they just really need some help with just simple, basic food items. And so we do this once, uh, once a month. It's the second Tuesday of every month from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. I just thought I'd throw that in there in case any volunteers want to volunteer. But uh, 9 to 11, the second Tuesday of every month. And one of the things that we've started doing is that I will ask them, Before I hand them the bag of of, of food, I will ask them, can I pray for you? And then I'll ask them, if they say yes, I, I would love for you to pray for me. Then I'll ask them, well, how can I pray for you? Can you give me some specific ways that I can pray for you? And you know what? I have never been turned down by someone when I've asked them, can I pray for you? And most of the time, 95% of the time, they will give me specific ways that we can pray 
for them. I will pray for them and then hand them the bag of food. Be watchful. Be attentive for opportunities to pray. If you want to make a kingdom impact in the lives of other individuals in this community, in Winston County, if you want to make a kingdom impact in the lives of people who constitute this church, be watchful for ways that you can pray. Listen, I have been in doctor's offices more than I care to be in the last two or three, four months. (laughs) I'm getting tired of it, I'll be honest with you. But I can't tell you how many times I've had an opportunity to pray for someone who was sitting right next to me waiting in that office. Now, I may not always let them know that I'm praying for them. I may, I cheat. I I overhear their conversations with others, and I, I think, well, I can pray for them in this way. I don't even ask them. I just pray. Be watchful. For opportunities to pray. Secondly, if you're really empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to the glory of God, want to make a personal kingdom impact in the lives of others as a church, but as a personal disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's where it begins right there in your personal life. Love them, love them, love them, love them. Notice what verse 8 says. And above all things have fervent love for one another. For love will cover what? A multitude of sins. The Bible says that we as believing children of God, because of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, have the opportunity to live with a fervent love. What does that mean? Well, it's a a powerful love that causes us that irregardless of how we may be treated, irregardless of what may be said to us, irregardless of someone else's sin that that troubles our hearts about the way that they're living, that we are going to love them anyway. That's what it means for for love to cover a multitude of sins. I'm so grateful to God that when I was living such a life that I was living before I was saved at 19 years old, from 15 to 19, it was a rough life. It's a thousand wonders I'm alive today or not in prison. But I'm so grateful to God for that deacon in my, my home church who driving home with him or riding home with him from work, I was working uh, for him that summer building swimming pools. Now, you have not worked until you have built a swimming pool in South Mississippi in the middle of July. (laughs) It's hot. Driving home with him, riding with him that afternoon, he began to take an interest in my life and began to tell me about Jesus Christ who died and shed his blood for my sin and who was risen from the dead. That was the beginning point of God beginning to deal with my heart and ultimately lead me a personal relationship with Christ. Why? Because, listen, he loved me. He loved me enough to tell me about Jesus. You see, it's not up to you and I to judge others in the way that they conduct their life. By the way, sinners do what sinners do. They're doing what just comes naturally to them. And so we have no right to judge. Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. Condemn not lest you be condemned. Pardon, you shall be pardoned. Give and it shall be given unto you. They shall pour into your lap a good measure. 
pressed down, shaken together, running over. And by your standard of measure, it shall shall it be measured back unto you. Love them. Love them. Love them. Listen, when that family member ticks you off, love them. That doesn't happen to anybody, does it? Altars open at the invitation time. When that person at work offends you by something that they say or some joke that they... Just just love them. That doesn't mean you excuse it. You just love them with the love of Jesus. We, we dealt with this. I'm not going to go any farther with this because we dealt with this the last time I was here, I believe, out of John 15. But just love them with an unconditional, sacrificial love in action. Making a kingdom difference in their life. I'm telling you, it works. The Holy Spirit of God, I can't explain it, but he uses it to soften hearts of lost and dying sinners who are going to hell. So what can we do? Well, the end of all things is near. And you think it was near for Peter and them, what do you think about our lives today? We're closer than we've ever been. And so we have an opportunity of a lifetime to make kingdom differences in the lives of others through praying for them and through loving them. But notice with me thoroughly, the Bible also gives us another way that we can be kingdom impactful people in the lives of others today. And that is Give, give, give. Notice with me the next verse. Verse 9, be hospitable to one another, uh uh-oh, without grumbling. (laughs) Do we have any grumblers here this morning? If I could lift my two feet, I would. I'm the chief of all sinners. My wife would amen that. I'm glad she's not with us this morning. Amen. I'm so spoiled rotten living in this world. I got this hand surgery. I'm left-handed, so I'm having to learn how to do some things differently And just be a little bit more patient because understanding it's going to take a little bit more time to function than it typically does, at least for the next two weeks, anyhow. I just fall rotten. I get so easily aggravated because I can't do this quick enough. Things that, yeah, y'all get it. I mean, you've, I'm sure, Michael, you've been there. You've been there, done that with the knee surgery. You understand it? Be hospitable. You take the ending off of that word and you change it just a little bit. I don't think we would do an injustice in scriptures by doing that because literally this is what the word means. It gives, in the Greek language, it gives us the, 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 the picture of a hospital. That we are to be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to the glory of God and to be a living hospital for others in life. I went into the hospital Friday morning to have this surgery done. And uh, why did I go there? Because I had a need. Because I was hurting. I actually become pretty dangerous driving. And, and I had a need to get this thing fixed. And so I went. And it, it, painful, yes. It has been somewhat painful, yes. But thank God for the medical technology of this day and time. Now, folks, I want to tell you, I believe that the ecclesia, the body of Christ, the most important organism that is living and alive on on earth today, the most important of all organisms on, on, on earth today is his church. And it is an organism. It is not an organization. Don't ever 
compare the church to an organization because it's not. It is a living, breathing organism, or a heaven-born, spirit-anointed, spirit-empowered church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all God asks us to do is empowered by the Holy Spirit to His glory be a hospital for other people without griping and grumbling and complaining about it. You know, when someone walks up in here, maybe they're visiting. And they're coming in out of life where they're hurting. They're looking for answers. Answers that perhaps you've already found in Christ. Josh, your pastor, should not be the first one that meets them at the door. The elders should not be the first ones that meet them at the door. It should be any given one of us empowered by the Spirit of God Meet them at the door, wrap our arms around them, hug them, love on them. Hey, man, I'm glad to see you here this morning. I'm glad you're here. I hope you have a, just a great experience with the Lord. And when they leave, and, 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 and encourage them to come back. Just loving on people. Because they're here, they show up if they're hurting, and they're spiritually lost, and they're looking for the most important Answers to the questions in life, which Jesus is the answer to every question we have. There's no mistake that they are here. And I say that to every one of our churches when I have an opportunity to do that. To be a place that is a place of healing for the hurting. A place of answers for those who question and who are searching for the truth. One more. Empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to the glory of God. Not only can we make a kingdom impact as a people of God through praying, through loving, and through giving. Giving of ourselves, investing in the lives of others. But fourthly, we can do that through serving one another. Serving others. I want you to see this in verse 10. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, that is, serves, let him do it with the ability which comes, which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. The emphasis is serving. Not only at our, prof- at, our, at our moment of conversion, the moment where we came to saving faith in Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, did the Holy Spirit of God take up residence within our lives, but He also equipped us with 
at least one spiritual gift. And that's what these two verses is talking about. We all have, at least, listen, if you're born again and you're born from above, you have at least one spiritual gift. I have four, primarily, that have been dominant over my 36 years of, 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 of life, Christian living. Some have three, some have two, some have one. But not every, not one person has all of the gifts because if one person sitting here this morning had all of the spiritual gifts, we would not need anyone else. So we all have some, at least one, given to us at conversion, at the point where we were saved by grace through the shed blood of Christ. And what the Bible tells us here is that we as a people of God living in this day and time just as they were in their day, we are to take those spiritual gifts or gifts that God has blessed us to receive and to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God and use them to serve others through the church. Which in turn builds up the body of Christ according to Ephesians chapter 4. And to do so to the glory of God. To be empowered by the Holy Spirit and, and just to do it to the glory of God using whatever gifts it is that God has given to build up the lives of other people. You know what that takes? Sometimes that takes what Jesus did, what he said when he described what true discipleship is. He said, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. We are not going to do what God has empowered us to do unless we die to ourselves to begin with. So how are you doing? If the rapture was to happen today, if the rapture was to happen tomorrow, now remember, we're all supposed to be living our life as if this is going to happen tomorrow. For the end of all things is at hand. When it comes to praying for others, how you doing? When it comes to loving on others, how you doing? When it comes to giving, investing in the lives of others, how you doing? When it comes to serving, just taking up the servant's towel and using your gifts, how you doing? I want to close this morning with a story that is very near and very dear to my heart. And hopefully I can get down off of here without falling. I better come down the other way because if I put pressure on that hand, you're going to hear me scream. <sighs> See, I didn't fall off a turnip truck yesterday, did I? I want to close it with this story. In 2009, April of that year, I left a very good ministry. Under the calling of God, but I left Knox Peter Baptist Church and moved to Oklahoma. Stacy's dad had had a very serious accident back in 07, and I had attempted for about a year and a half to try to get us, maybe the Lord would open a door for us to get closer to where her dad lived in Oklahoma to help care for him. Because, folks, I've always put God first, family second, and the church and everything else beyond that. That's just where my heart's at. And so when we left, we moved to Oklahoma. 
And I'll tell you the truth. I inherited the biggest mess <laughs> that I had ever inherited in my life. They had been without a pastor for two years. Two years prior to that, me going there, they, they were running about 250 to 300 or so, 300, 350 or so, but they had lost 200, 250 members two years earlier. Because of the, some of the decisions that were made, and things of that nature. We show up, my son Matthew was three months old. You ever, listen, you better know God's in it when you move across country with a three-month-old. We show up, and all the kids, all the teenagers went with their parents when they left. We inherited, uh, we're writing about 90 in Sunday school. We push 100 every once in a while. Church was hurting. The only kids that were there were just about three or four of them. And then there was my three-month-old son and my music minister's nine-month-old son. That was it. One teenager, his son. No, no, Lord, what are you going to do here? Velma Haynes. She would have been 100 years old this past June if she was still living, but she's been before the throne of Jesus for about eight years now. She was 85 years old when I met her. One of those faithful saints that had stuck it out at Eastern Heights. Velma came to me one day and she said, I want to start working with the kids that we do have. I said, well, Velma, there's not about three or four of them. They're different ages. They, they range from three months old to five years old. She said, it doesn't matter. So she started right there on Wednesday nights with a handful of kids we had. And... Um, she called the ministry doers of the word ministry based on James chapter 1 where the Bible says be ye doers of the word not hearers only. And before you knew it I looked up and we were running about 20, 25 kids on Wednesday nights and I thought hallelujah look at this. But I left there five years later we were running about 60 to 65 children on Wednesday nights and about 45 to 50 youth on Wednesday nights had been able to call up by a vocational youth ministry. I didn't do that. I just got out of the way and said, Miss Velma, I'm going to love on you and I'm going to pray for you, but I'm going to put everything in your hands that you need to do the work of the ministry. But I, and I stayed out of that lady's way. And lo and behold, she's been in heaven about eight years now. I've been away from there for ten years. And do you realize that that ministry is still thriving and going today? But do you know why? Because an 84, 85-year-old lady empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to the glory of God did what she could with what she had been given and she did it for the glory of God. She prayed, prayed, prayed. She loved, loved, loved. She gave, gave, gave. And she served, served, served. Now my question this morning is this. Who will be the Velma Haynes of the Way Community Church?
You don't have to be the most talented, the most gifted. Just do what you can for what you have been given and do it to the glory. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that Holy Spirit, you would just give freedom and that we would respond obediently to you. Lord, you know the need. You, you know if there's a person here who needs to be saved, I pray that would come to Jesus this morning. But I, I pray that if there's a person here who just really, they need to just commit themselves to being used of you to make kingdom impacts in the lives of others. I, I pray, Lord, that, that you would just lead them to the point of making a decision of commitment to you this morning. And God, I just want you to be glorified more than anything else in the decisions that are made. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. You respond as God so moves in your heart.